Loving God, you breathed out the Bible, your word. So we say, pray that the same Holy Spirit who breathed the word out will open our eyes and ears, give us understanding and lead us in the way of conviction, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I was having a conversation with a stylist, someone who gets men and women ready to go on to television on a weekly basis. What qualifications do you need to be a stylist? Well, she said, you've got to be able to sew. Or oh, don't you buy the clothes? Oh yes, but you have to sew them. If it's a size 18 dress, you have to be able to click off, clip off the size 18 and sew on size 16. And if it's men, uh, waistband size 40 centimetres, you have to be able to click that off and sew on 38 centimetres. Now just hang on. Yeah, okay. Um, because people can't take much reality. Now that is true. We can't bear much reality. Do you remember the Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser? Life wasn't meant to be easy, he said. We never re-elected him. Bob Carr said that for most people, life is an inherently disappointing experience. We never re-elected him. Uh, Oliver Cromwell said to his portrait painter, paint me warts and all. I want all the roughnesses. I want all the pimples. I want the warts. Just as you see me, that's as I want me to see me. We can't take much reality. Now, the secularist, of course, who doesn't read the Bible, always has a high opinion of the human condition and is shocked by human wickedness. But those of us who read the Bible know that the Bible, whenever it talks about humankind, paints us warts and all. So here is Abraham, and Abraham deceives regarding the identity of his wife, Sarah. And here is Moses, who in a fit of rage kills the Egyptian in the desert and buries his body there. And here is King David, who commits adultery. And here is Peter, who denies Christ. And here is Ananias and Sapphira, who enter into hypocrisy. And here is the church, which goes to earnest prayer that God will deliver Peter from prison, but doesn't believe for one minute that God will answer their prayer. The Bible paints us realistically it paints us warts and all because God knows what we are like. Someone said the human heart is a volcano. It's not, not always erupting, but it is always a volcano. It's always got that capacity. So it's no surprise when you look at 1 Corinthians 5 on the front page of your service sheet there that Paul says this to the church at Corinth. Now, the secularists were dreadfully scandalised by such a truth, but the Bible affirms it. Paul planted this church in Corinth. Corinth was a particularly debauched city. It was built between two ports and it was difficult to be a Christian in that city. And yet here we see in chapter 5, verse 9, that Paul paints a realistic portrait of the Christian here. He says, I wrote in my earlier letter, which we don't have, that you Christians are to have nothing to do with sexually immoral people. I didn't mean, look at what he says, I didn't mean by that the sexually immoral, the greedy, the swindlers, the idolaters in the world, that is those who are in the streets of Corinth, you'd have to go out of the world in that case. Who would you talk to? Who would you have anything to do with? Because the world is full of people like that. No, he says. And here's the reality shock. Look at verse 11. Underline it if you've got your Bible there. Verse 11. I'm writing, he says, about the sexually immoral and the greedy and the idolater and the reviler and the drunkard and the swindler in the church. I'm writing that you have nothing to do with those who bear the name brother, and yet they can be characterised in all those ways. Don't associate with them, he says. Don't even eat with them. Why? Because they are mocking Christ. They claim to be part of his body, his church, but they live lifestyles like that. And people observe the way they live and they degrade the church. Well, if that's Christ's people, I don't want to have anything to do with them. Separate from them. See what he says? Not even eat with such a one. Now, you've got to say, how is it that professing Christians of the first century can live like this and, be, and can be categorised as they are in chapter 5? Idolaters, swindlers, greedy, etc.? How can this happen? 
Well, it happens because of deception, deceit. Deceit always comes from the devil. He's the great deceiver. Now, if you turn the page and come to chapter 6, and we'll see about this deception. And the people of Corinth, the Christians there, had been believing two lies. Now, let this be a warning to us, I think, that any time you hear people put down theology, just be careful about that. Because what you believe about God will influence the way you live. And it was influencing the way these people were living in, as Christ's people in Corinth. They had become deceived by two lies. And you know the lies because they're in quotation marks. Have a look there at verse 12. Here's the first lie. All things are lawful for me. And Paul repeats that. All things are lawful for me. But not everything is helpful is going to build up. Elsewhere he says, I don't want to become an addict to anything. Now the thinking was this. Now I am a man or a woman in Christ. I now have a passport to live any way I please. I can indulge any passion. Uh, in other words, Christian liberty means license. It means indulgence. There's always forgiveness, so I don't have to worry. Greed, swindle, immorality, now I'm in Christ. I'm free to indulge in all these things. Paul says, don't be deceived. Literally, don't be let off the path. The second lie is there in verse 13, again in quotation marks. Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach is meant for food. And both the food and the stomach, the body, are both physical, and they're both finite, and therefore they don't have an ultimate future. <laughs> God's going to destroy them both, that's what it says. A common way for the thinking in Greek society, that I'm not my body, it's physical, and so these people think, now I'm a Christian, I'm a spiritual being. My body is irrelevant. It's not my responsibility. Whatever my body involves itself in, in drunkenness and in swindling and immorality, well, that's not me. That's finite. That's physical. I'm infinite. I'm spirit. I'm spiritual. And that's not me. This is a deception. Look how often in this section Paul speaks of his body. Now, I tested this this morning. Uh, I looked in the mirror and I looked at my body. <laughs> what do you think I was thinking when I looked at my body? Well, I don't know. What would you think when you look at your body? What do you think of your body? Well, I wish it would have been like this. I wish it would have been like this. I wish it had some more muscle here, more muscle there. We don't generally like our body, do we? We like to think that our body can be different than what it is. You know, the world out there says, well, your body is a pleasure machine. Oh, it's finite. No, Paul says. Eight times he mentions the body. Think about your body the way God thinks about your body. He made it. Verse 13, look at this. The body, he says, for the Lord is for the Lord. And he is for the body. He made it. He made it for you and he made it for him. He's all for your body. Verse 14, just as he raised Jesus' body, he will raise our body as well. Our body has an eternal future. This past week, I've been to the, friend, uh, the funeral of a friend who I was in Bible college with 50 years ago, and we treated his body with great respect as we committed it to the ground. That reflects the Christian view of the body. That it's not to be discarded. It has a future, and it is to be respected. Verse 15, the body is a member of Christ. The body is attached to Jesus, and so don't attach it immorally in an illicit way. Verse 18, sexual immorality, that is, Paul says here, a sin against the body. I'm sinning against God, but I'm sinning against my own body, which is made in his image. And Paul, go, Paul goes on in verse 19 and says, don't you realise that your body literally is a temple? And he uses the word for the inner sanctum, the shrine. Your body is the shrine in which the Holy Spirit dwells. That's your body. Your physical body is the shrine in which the Spirit of God dwells. So all this he sums up in verse 20. Glorify God in your body. So your body is here as an instrument for you to bring glory to God. Eight times Paul talks about the body. Your body is important to God. It's an instrument to be used to honour him. So don't be deceived and think, 
that you can ignore it and ignore your use of it, ignore accountability and responsibility for it. Don't think that its activities are unimportant and can be separated from you. That's what Paul's saying. You are deceived so that, chapter 5, you are in the church living this way and you're deceived because you're not thinking rightly about liberty and you're not thinking rightly about the body that God has given you. Now, let's look at chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. And if you look at verses 9 and 10, you'll see that the Apostle Paul repeats the activities he's listed in chapter 5, 9 and 10. But he adds three activities in chapter 6 that are not in chapter 5. He adds adulterers, men who practice homosexuality, and thieves. And he is saying that all of these people who are living apart from the lordship of Jesus, as though they are Lord, they are not living under the lordship of Jesus and his kingly rule, and yet they are a part of the professing Christian church at Corinth. They gather with the believers. They call themselves brothers and sisters. They are living a, a double life because they have been deceived about liberty and deceived about their body. They are showing that they are not part of God's family and will have no share in the inheritance of God's people. It's quite clear, isn't it? This is what scripture says. You can look at the Greek, you know. I looked at the Greek uh, this, just this morning, the latest, and the Greek says what the English says. There's no way out. Twice, look at verse 9, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 10, none of these practitioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Here is a statement to jolt the church out of its deception. This cannot be your lifestyle. You can't be unrepentant about this and expect to have anything in heaven waiting for you. You will not inherit the kingdom of God if you are an unrepentant adulterer. You will not inherit the kingdom of God if you are an unrepentant idolater. You will not inherit the kingdom of God if you are an unrepentant practicing homosexual. You will not inherit the kingdom of God if you are an unrepentant thief. You will not inherit the kingdom of God if you are an unrepentant, covetous, greedy person. You will not inherit the kingdom of God if you are an unrepentant drunkard. You will not inherit the kingdom of God if you are an unrepentant reviler or abuser. You will not inherit the kingdom of God if you are an unrepentant fraudster and swindler, if that's your habitual lifestyle, Paul says, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But then, verse 11, and such were some of you. <laughs> he says, there is no ground on the part of any of us here of moral superiority, or we would never be that. We would never do those things. To a greater or lesser extent, this is our background. Now, you don't believe it. I have coffee most mornings of the week, early in the morning down there. And I say to the bloke sitting around at coffee, why don't you come to church? Oh, they say, oh, if we came to that church, the ceiling would collapse. On what basis do they think I come to this church? That I've got every right to be, oh, yeah, you're good, you're moral, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Oh, yeah, the, the ceiling won't collapse on you. Don't believe it. Our CV, our background, this is our background. My record is my problem and my record does not qualify me to be with God's people in God's kingdom. It doesn't, it doesn't qualify me and it doesn't qualify you. And so Paul says, such were some of you. He does not say such are some of you. He says such were some of you. This is part of of your curriculum vitae. This is part of your CV. But by the activity of God, verse 11, look at what he says. They were dirty. You were washed. You were forgiven through the cross. You were no different to the drunkard and the abusive reviler in the immoral population of Corinth until God sanctified you. In other words, God's spirit spoke to you and called you out of all that darkness to belong to God. And like everyone else, look at verse 11, you were condemned before God until God set you right with him. He justified you through the work of Jesus. 
And all of this, verse 11, have a look at it, has been applied to you by the spirit of our God. So I'm part of God's kingdom. I'm adopted into his family. I have a certain inheritance because that's God the Father's plan. The basis of my adoption is God the Son's work on my behalf. And it is God the Holy Spirit who now applies it to me and separates me out. I love that description of what is a Christian by J.I. Packer, the author. He said, a Christian could say, I'm a child of God. God is my father. Heaven is my home. Every day is one day nearer heaven. My saviour is my brother. And every Christian is my brother or sister too. And all of that's by grace. It's not by merit. I'm forgiven. I didn't earn it. Christ did. I'm set apart. His spirit sovereignly did that. And I'm set right to be in God's kingdom and inherit his kingdom so that my lifestyle is not idolatrous, thieving, swindling, morally uncontrolled, homosexual, homosexually active. We're not perfect, but that's what we were. It's not what we are. So don't be deceived. Well, what does this have to do with Anzac Day, I hear you saying? This surely is our great national day, isn't it? I was up at four o'clock this morning listening to the Cenotaph service. Uh, it's interesting, when you come to Australia Day, we argue all the time about the date, but there's no argument about the date of Anzac Day, uh, April the 25th. It's a great day. It's a day when we remember service. All those who fought under our flag, served under our flag from the Boer War up to Afghanistan. And the great generation represented by my parents, maybe your grandparents, that great World War II generation. And I, just this week, I was telling someone about the Kokoda Trail, and I found I, I could not contain my emotion in telling the story of what happened at the Kokoda Trail. And simply, if you tell your children about the rats of Tobruk, I believe it's very difficult for us to control our emotion when you look at those two great uh, campaigns, Tobruk and New Guinea and the Kokoda Trail. Men and women fought, they died, to resist fascist and communist regimes that threaten our liberty. So a couple of weeks ago, I was in Melbourne, and here's old Wilf. Wilf, full of cataracts, his eyes are no good, born the same year as Queen Elizabeth II, 1926. In 1944, Wilf was 18 years of age. His two older brothers had gone to war, and Wilf enlisted at the age of 18 in order to go to war as well. They noticed that when they enlisted Wilf that he had a sharp mind, and so they allocated him to an intelligence unit to work with General Douglas MacArthur. He was to go up into the islands and intercept Japanese radio communications. And I said to him, the great generation, I said, Wilf, why did you do it? Why did your brothers do it? Oh, he said, I did it for freedom and liberty. And he said, pointing at me, there are a number of evangelical Christians in our unit and we did it to ensure the preaching, the free preaching of the gospel. That's why we fought. And here is the turning point of this sermon. The, we honour our Anzacs the best as we cherish and are ready to defend the freedoms for which they fought. We honour our Anzacs the best as we cherish and are ready to defend the freedoms for which they fought and for which many gave their lives. Why have I chosen to preach on 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11? Because these are the very verses which Israel Folau quoted on social media, which got him decontracted by the Australian Rugby Union and the National Rugby League refused to recontract him. The chairman of the National Rugby League, Peter Volandi, said this, the game is inclusive. I have no tolerance for people who put others' lives at risk. Well, neither do I, and I'm sure neither do you. So what did Israel say? Quote, warning, drunks, homosexuals, adulterers, liars, fornicators, thieves, atheists, idolaters, hell awaits you. Repent. Only Jesus saves, end quote. Could he have been more diplomatic? Yes. 
the passage doesn't say anything about hell. It just says you won't inherit the kingdom of heaven. Could he have been more true to context? Yes. Because these are verses which are addressed to professing Christians. But is what Israel said true? Yes. Those who are inside and outside the church, living under their own lordship, hell awaits you. And represent and re repentance is commanded. You heard the word to repent. I did. Did you not shudder the other night if you watch q and I did two weeks ago, and the politician there who was a practising homosexual said, I refuse to repent for my sexuality. And you think, man, that's blatant, isn't it? You will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, it's true. He could be more diplomatic. He could have been more true to context. But he's put down because it's a hate-filled message. But if I shout fire and there's no fire, then that's hate-filled, isn't it? Because it can lead to chaos. It can lead to destruction. People can trample over one another if there's no fire. But if it's true, fire, then it's a most loving and courageous warning. This afternoon at the Sydney Cricket Ground, the Anzac Round will continue. The mighty roosters will play the dragons. The last post will be played. There'll be a minute's silence. And the NRL, which I believe is profoundly anti-Anzac, will continue to deny livelihood to a man who's not violent, not law-breaking, but has the audacity to publish a list of the hellbound who need to repent. So the morally vacuous, inclusive sport excludes him. Anzac freedom, denied. Friends, it takes courageous love to warn of imminent danger. And Paul is warning the professing Christians at Corinth with this courageous love. Beyond death, there is a tribunal. Beyond death, you will meet Jesus the judge. Repent of your own lordship. Be washed. Be separated. Be justified. It's the only preparation for the tribunal. Be ready for it because it's coming. Be warned. And Paul tells them this because it is both a loving and courageous message. On Monday morning, I'm sitting with my friend having coffee. He's doing the Sydney Morning Herald crossword this last Monday. We're sipping coffee. Um, he says, um, future of the wicked, nine letters starting with P. I said, oh, I don't know. He said, perdition, wouldn't that be right? I said, probably, but I personally don't use the word because the Bible talks about heaven and hell. Oh, do you believe heaven and hell? Yes. I believe heaven is to be with God forever and I believe that hell is to be separated from God forever. Oh, well, I hope I'll be okay, because I'm not that bad. Now, what do you do? What do you do? I sit there, and I tell you, well, I tell you what, I'm a coward. I want to keep being his friend. Oh, I'll be okay, because I've not been too bad. I can't leave it. I can't be neutral. If I'm on a moving train and I know the bridge is out coming up, I've got to warn them. God will judge me for my silence. And I said to this lovely man, something like this, you know, the Bible says we're all short of God's standard and it's only Jesus who qualifies us for heaven. You've got to trust in him. And, you know, yesterday afternoon... I watched the Sunday afternoon footy from Leichhardt Oval and Tommy Radonikus had just died. And I heard the Channel 9 commentator say this, I believe Tommy's up there having a beer with Artie Beetson and they're watching this match. And I'm sure they are. And I said to my friend Des, I said, how is he sure they're up there? That is just nonsense. That is just made up trivial nonsense. God believes that where we go at death is terribly important. God takes it seriously enough to send his own dear son 
And it's only by grace. And none of us deserve it. And no merit can earn it. Only Jesus can. So have a go at Israel. But when you're having a go at Israel, (laughs) ask yourself the question, what do you say? How do you bear testimony? How do you stand up on the moving train when you know the bridge is out? I'm a coward, but I know the bridge is out and I can't be neutral. So that's what this message is about. Don't be deceived. There's no inheritance if you're not in the family. And you won't be in the family except by grace and except by being washed through trusting Jesus, by being separated, sanctified, and by being justified, being put right with God. It's like that sign that they used to have years ago on City Road. God has fixed the judgment day. Flee to Jesus. He will save you.